guys, it's Chelsea, and I am here to welcome you to a very special episode of The Financial Confessions. Now, this episode is special for a few reasons. Uh, first and probably foremost, because it is with uh, my actual good friend and friend of TFD and former guest of the show, Erin Lowry of Broke Millennial. Uh, she is like me, a fellow New Yorker. We see each other frequently uh, on off hours, but she's also kind enough to collaborate with me on special TFD stuff. And in this case, it was our first live podcast ever. We held it at the very end of 2022 here in Manhattan, and we wanted to do something kind of fun and lighthearted after what was, you know, a pretty turbulent financial year in 2022. So we decided that we'd talk all about the big flops of the year, kind of what we were leaving behind and what we were bringing along with us. And since we're passing the midpoint of this season of the Financial Confessions, I thought it would be a nice time uh, to drop in this very special live episode with Aaron and look back a little bit at what we left behind last year year and reaffirm our values for the good stuff that we're bringing with us financially and otherwise through 2023. I hope you guys enjoy this episode as much as Aaron and I enjoyed recording it. We will be doing more live podcasts both in New York and around the country. So don't forget to always follow us on social media or on YouTube uh, where we will always be announcing our event and tour dates. All right, guys, I'll see you next week on a not live episode of the Financial Confessions. But in the meantime, please enjoy this one. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, If I could just request before we get started, I would love to take a quick video from my perspective uh, because someone on Instagram today was like, girl, you're doing TikToks now. These Gen Zers are going to eat you up for these boomerangs. You got to stop with those. Um, That's so rude. You know what? But when they're right, they're right. So everyone like make some noise. Like... But wasn't that just like a back and forth, like a boomerang? So is it just that it's longer? You know what? And actually, after I trim it down, it will look identical to a boomerang. We just need to be like... (laughs) Yes. Old habits die hard. Um, But welcome, everyone, and thank you for coming out. And thank you so much, Erin, for joining us. Um, So as promised, we are filming our first live episode of TFC. And since it is the end of 2022, I thought it would be fun to talk about all of the money flops of 2022. Uh, So we can sort of just like reminisce, say goodbye, rest in peace, and then sort of move into 2023 on a better note. Um, But first, before I get into it, I would love to just uh, give a little welcome to Aaron. And who are you for those who may not know? Aaron Lowry, author of the three-part, soon-to-be four-part, Broke Millennial series, which, thank you, thank you. Uh, I have a workbook dropping in May, which I guess this is the first time I am publicly talking about that. Thank you. Um, So in getting into our flops of 2022 from a financial POV, I feel like we have to start with probably the biggest, most prominent, most sort of rich territory, which is crypto. Speaking of Have you guys heard of this? (laughs) Um, So let's just like, um, how much did you lose this year on crypto, Erin? Luckily zero, because I wasn't invested in it. (laughs) That is... (laughs) That is not investing advice. Uh, Everything we say up here is not investing advice. I just want to do the full disclaimer now. Cindy, if we could get the legalese out here as well, I would really appreciate that. Um, So I want to just kind of go through a little bit about what happened in crypto this year, talk it out, and sort of see what lessons we can take going into 2023. Um, So first and foremost, I feel like we've pretty much forgotten about this now because so much other terrible stuff has happened. I was going to say terrible sh**. Can I curse? (laughs) <laughs> oh my god thank god you know uh because so much other terrible shit has happened but let's talk a little bit about where it kind of all started this year which was with Terra. yeah i was back in i want to say may so five years ago in may of 2022 <laughs> and listen i'm not an economist and i don't closely follow crypto because again i don't invest in it and we can get into a whole conversation about that in a second but Basically, a stable coin, which like is not supposed to lose value, all of a sudden it's like, by the way, these can like totally lose value and crash and plummet, and everybody who's invested in this can lose all of their money, and there's really no safe gap. Which, listen, the stock market is not super dissimilar in the sense that there is no safe gap. Like if you are invested in something like I don't know Enron, and it, which depending on the, I feel like the responses really like aged the room. <laughs> The giggles, like people are like, oh, I know what that is. And the other people are like, Googling this later. (laughs) 
so Google it later, but if you were invested in Enron, you really weren't seeing your money back. So the same works for the stock market. Now, crypto and the stock market are not the same thing, so we just want to make that clear. But basically, Terra and Luna, which I believe are like kind of one and the same. I don't know everything about it. None of these names matter. That's true. <laughs> Lost all their value. The guy who created it is hiding out in Serbia, I think. He is a South Korean national. a better national. locale. Yeah, that's, I actually was Googling that this morning, and it was like, believed to be hiding out in Serbia. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> it's winter. <laughs> It's never good when you're hiding out in Eastern Europe in the dead of winter. <laughs> like, that's when you know things are bad. Um, but so a lot of people lost money on this. And I have to say that, like, we do want to have, we want to hold two things. Like, this is a safe space. Can you guys make some discreet noise if you maybe had a little bit of crypto in your portfolio? <laughs> So if we amped that up, I'm going to say like 10% of the room would have wooed. Yeah, and it's okay. <laughs> you can be diversified into crypto just for the love of God. Don't have all of your money invested in crypto. I will say though, and we'll get into this a little bit with all of the celebrities being sued, but it's worth noting that like this year, bad men have done things unrelated to crypto. And I just sort of as a rule started Googling their name crypto and a shocking number of them had done like public written blogs or speaking engagements about how they were crypto maximalists or at least very into getting their audience into it. Um, and I have to shout out my husband who's uh, eating right now. Mark, you wanna raise your hand? Hello. Uh, his team is going to the World Cup on Sunday. Um, but I actually feel like I'm getting, I know what it feels like to be a Patriots fan now because I'm like, you've won enough. Like France has won the World Cup. Like. Someone else can win Whoa. now. Whoa, just as, because uh, my husband's in the room and the I Patriots know. just got referenced and he's a Buffalo Bills fan. Um, oh my God, guys, I'm sure he just loved that. So I just have to say the, the word Buffalo Bills because I'm just contractually obligated if somebody yes. says Patriots. Okay, uh, great, we can move on. Go Bills, um, Bills Mafia. But I will say that my husband did tell me when we were planning to do an even strictly educational event about crypto in February, just like educating people about what it was. He was like, Chelsea, you cannot do this. He was like, <laughs> he was like, you must treat it like an MLM and or like a virus. Um, and if you one in the same, yes. And if you even give people the slight inclination that this is a good thing to invest in, you will have bl uh, blood on your hands. So, I would love to hear just a little bit your take on. Obviously, SBF was just arrested. Um, the justice system working in real time. Let's hear it for that. Uh, <laughs> Eight uh, counts, I think. Eight counts. Things. Yes. Wire okay. fraud, money things. I don't know. Not and laundering. I was going to say laundering. I, it, that wasn't what it was. <laughs> but perhaps more relevantly for what we do, a whole host of celebrities are getting their asses sued yes. for having marketed this stuff. Including Patriots, former QB, Tom Brady. Yes. Can I get a nod if that's correct? Yeah. <laughs> Woo. Look at that. Steph Curry, I believe, is involved. Also, like, Larry Sanders might be into Matt it. Matt Damon. Yes. Also, Kim Kardashian has already paid her fine of $1.26 million for a shilling for crypto. She got paid a quarter of a million for a sponsored post. And they were like, hey, this doesn't adhere to all of the disclosures you need to have. And also, you are giving bad investing advice to your hundreds of millions of followers. So, yeah, I mean, I think the thing to also consider is both the founder of Terra and SBF were very famous for their tweets and their takes on crypto and manipulating the market through Twitter. <laughs> like, we've never heard that happen before. But it is also, I think, just really important to consider the various ways that the market, different types of markets are being manipulated. And this was uh, also a banger year for that to be happening, which sooner or later there will be rel um, some sort of legalese around that, but we're not there yet. So I feel like my big takeaway from this, and it sort of ties into the MLM of it all, but uh, which we'll talk about a little bit, but... I think my big takeaway for 2023 is like, don't get investing advice from Matt Damon. Even just listen, as people who have brands on social media talking about money, I'm still here to tell you, like, please be very careful about taking financial advice and especially investing advice from social media. Like, I really don't care where it's coming from or what credentials somebody says that they have. 
As somebody quoted in Broke Millennial Takes on Investing says, um, the value of the advice that you're getting is probably worth as much as you're paying for it. So if you're getting free advice, please fact check it. Like look at different people, talk to different people who have had different experiences. And especially if it's about some sort of fairly new asset class like cryptocurrency, if you don't understand how it works, like I don't totally get it guys. Like I'm gonna be the first to tell you I feel like I have a pre-K level understanding of the blockchain and then like you're building something on top of that. I don't know. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't get it. And that to me is a huge red flag. Like if you do not understand at a base level how something you're investing in works, why are you investing in that thing? Yeah, we all, I feel like at some point had a cousin who's like pulling you aside at Christmas, Thanksgiving, just being like, uh, just so you know, um, there's this thing called crypto and I'm all in and you got to get into it. And I feel like if like that cousin at holidays is selling you on something, it's probably a bad idea, but on a similar note. So I think one of the hardest things for a lot of people to accept in the crypto meltdown was that it was an MLM. Yeah. And I mean, they even... I watched some of the George Stephanopoulos interview of SBF, which I don't know if you caught any of that. It was painful. But he likens it to a Ponzi scheme. He basically straight up asks him, how are you different than Bernie Madoff? Which, again, I feel like that was an aging question. If, <laughs> so put that on the your list. Bernie Sanders. So Enron and then Bernie Madoff to be looked up after this podcast. But I think that that is a really powerful thing to be considering is if your business is being compared to a Ponzi scheme, if it's being called s snake oil at any point, and people just get super defensive and double down and can't sit down and talk through with you like, no, I understand maybe why you're saying that, but here is X, Y, Z reasons, and here is where our money comes from, and it's not like, hey, then we sell to someone else, and then they have to recruit 10 people, and then they sell to someone else, and then they recruit 10 people. You, you hear where I'm going with this. Yeah, it forms a triangle shape. Um, I think a pyramid is, is also what that something is the known Egyptians for. Made. Um, but I also do feel like a big lesson for me in 2023 is like the sunk cost fallacy has to go. Like so many people who lost on crypto, if they had been able to say earlier on, like this was maybe a mistake. I, I think this isn't going anywhere good. Like everyone else that I'm investing with is on like a subreddit yelling at each other. Like this is probably not a great sign. They would have ended up very well. Do you have any big takeaways from this meltdown? Yeah, don't put all of your money in one thing. This is the most basic and boring investing advice, which I am not certified to give you. <laughs> but truly diversify. Like that is just one of the basic tenets of investing and life is diversification. You want to have more than one egg in your basket and definitely true of your money. I mean, I would say, I mean, we might get into recession fears later, but thinking about how freelancers are actually set up for a recession in a very interesting way, because if you have multiple streams of income, then if you lose one client, it's not as big of a deal than if you have a job with just one employer and you get fired. Investing is not dissimilar. You want to make sure that your money is in different companies, different sectors, which is like companies doing different things. So like tech is over here doing one thing and manufacturing is over here doing another thing. And there's all sorts of different medicines over here doing a third thing. So you just want to make sure that your money is not all in one thing. The number of people that I feel like were broing out over crypto all had 95% to 100% of their money in crypto. Which is a mess. Um, okay, so another big flop of 2022 is the concept of buying a house as sort of rite of passage. Um, so I agree. Boo. Um, so here's the thing. I did buy uh, my, well, my husband and I, although I pay the mortgage, well, whatever. Um, <laughs> Let's dig into this particular conversation. It's a shared responsibility. <laughs> no, but I did buy a, a piece of property, not a home, famously. I don't know who owns homes in New York City, but I don't want to meet them. Um, an apartment uh, last year, but it was at a time when everyone, it was rats fleeing the Titanic out of New York and everything was rock bottom prices. Uh, so it was a good time for us to buy and I'm happy with the decision, but a lot of people have in the past two years especially, have paid a lot more money than they should have for a home. Um, and obviously mortgage rates being super low is you know, a reason to maybe do that more than you otherwise would. But my parents, for example, sold a home in Philadelphia at the peak of people fleeing New York City. They had 10 offers in 24 hours, 
all over asking. And listen, the couple that bought their home, I think they're perfectly nice. I'm sure that was a great idea for them. Well, I'm not, but... We we hope that they don't listen to this podcast. (laughs) Listen, they don't know whose house it was. Um, But more importantly, like, we're talking about a total frenzy. And what upsets me about it is not really, like, individually, maybe they'll make it out okay. Maybe some people who, like, moved to Greenwich, Connecticut in a panic and paid 200 k over asking on an already overinflated price are going to be fine. If you're moving to Greenwich, you're probably fine. But (laughs) it does bother me that we're still treating buying a home as a rite of passage when it is objectively, in so many cases, not a great financial idea for a lot of people and not something we should be judging people on. What's your take? Okay, two unpopular opinions. First, renting is not throwing away your money. I'm going to come back to that. Second, your primary residence is not an investment. What? So the reason I say that is just that when people talk about investing in real estate, what they're actually usually referring to is if you have multiple properties that you're able to cash flow because other people are living in it and giving you money that subsidize paying the mortgage, and then sooner or later you're earning money off of those properties. Your primary residence, unless you buy a duplex, for instance, which is actually a great idea, you're probably not cash flowing that with somebody else's money. Now, if somebody does live in your primary residence with you and pays you rent, great, you're winning. But most of the time, that's not how things work out with a primary residence. And for instance, if you buy over market, your house is not guaranteed to increase in value. That is a fallacy that exists that the housing market always goes up, up, up. Shall I point to 2008? So things happen. Also, so Enron, Bernie Madoff, (laughs) Great Recession, housing market, bubble collapse. But it is really important to remember that, yes, oftentimes... It can make sense to buy a primary residence if it's a place that you plan to live for a very long period of time, perhaps even so many decades that you've paid off your mortgage and you're going to live in there, but not free, by the way, because you still have to pay property taxes and you have to pay for upkeep and there's all sorts of other costs associated with owning a home. So rant one on that done, renting. It's a service. You know, when you exchange money for any sort of goods or service. We are not constantly chastising and shaming people that they're throwing away their money. If you're paying a landlord to live in an apartment, they are providing you a service, your shelter, and hopefully doing the basics to make sure that it's livable conditions. If it's not like, please take it up with the city. I know it's a pain, but do that. You also, depending on where you live, but New York City, it's an incredibly renter-friendly city. Usually, we don't have to pay for heat, depending on the situation, which this time of year is delightful. Your utilities might be lower. If I don't know, the upstairs tenant has a leak in the bathroom, and then your bathroom ceiling caves in at 2 o'clock in the morning. Not at all a real story, guys. (laughs) You can just call your landlord and be like, hey, um, the ceiling of the bathroom is in my tub. Could you please come handle this? And you don't have to pay for that. So there are advantages. It's also more flexible. As your life changes, it's easier to move around, get a living situation that better fits your lifestyle. So it is not throwing away your money. And rant. Wow. I agree. I can't really clap, but I agree. Um, Yes, also as someone who has gone from renting to owning an apartment in the past year, my husband can speak to this more than I can because he is on the co-op board. It's not what you think from watching Sex in the City. It's a lot more tedious. Um, But the number of emails that I have received in just the past week about an elevator are truly unbelievable, and I do pine for the days when that was none of my business. So even in New York City, there are a lot of sort of compromises you make when you do buy. But it's interesting that you point out the idea of being able to rent as passive income, which is important and often, quite frankly, a debate that we really struggle with at TFD, um, because I do think that there is a middle ground, but if there is a sort of soul sister to the crypto guys, it's the like TikTok Airbnb lords that have absolutely flooded our space with the worst possible content. I'm also just going to throw the fire movement in there. Like, sorry, guys, but half of that space is also like, just buy up 25 apartments in a low cost of living area and then gouge all the residents. It's, yeah, it's literally always a man in a black t-shirt being like, 
Uh, all you have to do is buy 50 apartments at $1,000 each, you rent them out, and then you're a millionaire within a year. Um, and obviously, a lot of these people are <laughs> severely over leveraged, come like, you know, any kind of downturn in interest for Airbnbs. But also, there is the question of like, hey, buddy, maybe this isn't great for a society to be doing this. Um, I'd love to hear your take on the Airbnb lords. I mean, don't love it. I do, it'll be interesting to see if cities ever like really crack down more than they have thus far. Obviously, we're all in a city that has a huge shortage of affordable housing that is also like quality housing. And it would be great to see some level of restrictions that prevent people from doing that. But then there's also like, hey, we live in a capitalist society and it's a free market. And if that's what the market will bear, that's what's going to happen. And until somebody steps in and deals with it, like that is what's going to happen until people respond in kind or Airbnb as an entity does something about it. I also would say for the people who can afford, probably not in this city, but to be good landlords, like if that is something that you are able to do, or if you're able to have a conversation with somebody in your life who is that person and talk about why it is critical that we have affordable quality housing and why you shouldn't gouge somebody every time a lease comes due, that's the Thanksgiving conversation you want to have with that uncle that you really don't want to talk to. That could make a huge difference in one person's life or multiple people's lives. I agree. Chairman Mao over here doesn't know if there's such a good thing, such a thing as a good landlord, but... <laughs> Um, hey, our landlords didn't gouge us this year, so woo! <laughs> shout out to that landlord. Um, also, like they at least have to come up with a less feudal term than landlord. Like <laughs> you're out here. I'm playing. not even gonna try. I was gonna spitball some ideas, but I'm not doing that. You're playing a pan flute and a jester costume, <laughs> man. My landlord is here. Anyway. Um, Okay, so housing is a concept, a bit of a flop in 2022. Also, mortgage rates, yikes, right now. Yeah, uh, sorry. That's the other, other thing I want to throw out there. Sorry, guys. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, but it's not a shock that housing in a, as a concept is a flop because the market as a concept is a bit of a flop this year. Let's hear about it. Yeah, I mean... Dead air. Like, what do you want me to say? Uh, I'm so sorry. Are we in a recession, Erin? <laughs> I mean, technically, have they called it yet? Like, I, I feel like Who every couple it? of Who months. Who calls it? Uh, the Fed. Not the Fed. No, it's not the Fed. It's the Economic Bureau Council people, neighbor. I, what is their whole thing? We're all asleep. Who? I'm not going to get full names. Guys, I'm not the economist. <laughs> okay, there's like a different branch. It's not the Fed and not the Treasury and not the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which actually is a very good website. I highly recommend checking it out, shockingly enough. Okay, they have great Elizabeth data. <laughs> if only. Uh, there's a different entity that also is like, yes, for realsies, we're in a recession now. And it feels like every couple of months they're like, yep, nope, yep, nope. There's a lot of doom and gloom about the predictions for 2023. I will say I don't feel like we need to go all the way down the rabbit hole of how bleak they are talking about a recession coming. And there's a lot of debate about whether it will be a short one or a long one and how intense it will be and how many people will be laid off. Fundamentally, then it comes down to what can you do to play some level of defense? So what can you do to try to shore up cash reserves right now? The one big thing, though, I will recommend Cycles are normal for the stock market. It goes up and it goes down. That is part of what it does. So please don't panic and sell everything or stop putting money into your 401k just because you don't like the angry red down that you see when you log in. Which, by the way, why do they still do that? <laughs> like, either change the color or just be like, it's a neutral color. It's just like black. This is the number. I don't need the green arrow or the red arrow. Thank you, Vanguard. <laughs> just my two cents. So I do think that the big thing is to remember just not to panic about it because truly a cyclical stock market is what is normal. It just sucks when you're in it and it doesn't feel good. If you don't like looking, don't look. Like it's really truly that easy. I did my net worth update for the first time in five months yesterday. I truly did not look at my investments for five months. I kept investing. I just didn't look at the numbers because you can put things on like, Auto invest. I feel like automating finances has come up a couple times now at this point. 
So that's one of my big spiels. I totally agree. I have treated, so we have a 401k at TFT, and for the past couple months, I've been like, I get those statements in my email. I'm like, that is none of my business. I don't need to know how bad things are, and I simply won't look unless I fear identity fraud. Um, but I will say for people who, for me, the biggest existential question is, does it matter if we're in a recession? I mean, it matters for the people who will end up out of work. I, in terms of personal finances, does it matter? I think inflation is what's impacting us more right now than the recession in terms of going to buy a latte, which I'm fine with doing, by the way. Totally vouch for you getting your lattes. But when you go in there and you're just a regular cow milk drinker and you're used to things coming out to $5 even and all of a sudden it's seven fifty with the tip, you're like... Okay, maybe David Bach had a point, and I'm going to rethink my lattes. Just kidding, still getting my lattes. But I do, I think inflation for all of us is really the bigger concern at the moment than the recession if you feel like you have job stability. If you don't, if you work in an industry that you think, yikes, I'm going to be one of the first people on the chopping block come a big recession, what can you be doing right now to play defense for that, especially as we're, we'll get to it depending on what's going to happen with your student loan payments? Okay, so possibly the biggest flop, Biden, um, of the past year has been student loan forgiveness. Fun fact, we recorded an advertisement telling people about the student loan forgiveness details that 12 hours later we had to completely re-record because the entire thing had changed and the ad was no longer relevant. Um, suffice to say, as someone, so I personally was not affected, community college, anyone? Oh, come on, guys. We can be prouder than that. Community college, anyone? Hell yeah. Um, as a concept and as something I did. Um, but also, yeah, didn't graduate, don't have the student loan, so it didn't affect me. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the bitterness we were seeing from people, which is also a bit of a flop. But as someone who has skin in the game from having to talk about it on TFD, but isn't directly implicated, even from that critical distance, I was like, what is this mess? Um, so I would just love to hear your take. And you have a pretty interesting perspective on it. So my husband and I paid off over $50,000 in student loans, which isn't as impressive as Cindy's. Um, Still though. In December, yeah. um, thank you, just wait for it. December of 2020, no, 2019. So if we're all doing that math. <clears throat> and did we go against everything I've ever told people to do and pull like a little bit out of our emergency fund because we're like, let's just get it done. Yep. So we went into 2020 feeling so good. We're like, paid off the student loans. We're feeling great. Time to travel. Time yep. to have a lot of close contact with had, other people. Had trips booked. And then, you know, we all know what happened. But I think the big thing, though, for me is that not only are we not going to be beneficiaries of forgiveness, we also didn't get to take advantage of the pause, and because we had paid it off right before the pause, we can't retroactively apply for the forgiveness either, because you had to have still been paying when the forget or had them when the pause was taking place. And I wrote probably what I got the most angry emails from Bloomberg readers for. I love writing for them. It's not them. It's the readers. <laughs> it was writing about the fact that I have zero animosity or bitterness towards the people who are going to be beneficiaries of forgiveness plans. Ooh. Um, one, because, I don't know, I guess I'm not a dick, but also, <laughs> it's so beneficial for so many people, and frankly, isn't going to really impact my wallet. And not that that was going to change my opinion either, but I think there's so much panic about that's going to impact me, but these same people who are writing me angry emails probably got stimulus checks. So, where did that money come from, guys? <laughs> It's incredibly frustrating to me that we aren't just more supportive also of the fact that this amount of money can be game changers and people also being able to participate in our economy in incredibly meaningful ways. We are not thinking all the way through of what this means for so many people or the bum deal we were all given when we were told to take out massive amounts of debt to go to college to get a degree to get a high paying job that evaporated in call back to 2008 when we are all graduating from college. True. Woo! <laughs> Truth. Um, yeah, I like did not, I had a 
one GPA when I graduated high school, so I was not getting courted by any universities. But um, it was those heady pre-crash days where um, if you weren't getting signed up to put yourselves in a mortgage amount of debt for a very third-rate college, um, like many of my, you know, like one of my, oh, God, I don't want to name, I can't name a specific college, but let's just say, did anyone in this... <laughs> room. Did anyone in this room go to the University of Southern Maine? Okay, safe space. Um, <laughs> this guy I went to high school with who graduated with like a hair's better GPA than I did was like, I'm going to the University of Southern Maine and put himself in all kinds of debt. And I was like, babe, was it worth it? Like, so, okay. So if you weren't getting courted for that, like that's where I got my first, they had Bank of America had a booth in my cafeteria giving out, I got a Hello Kitty branded $500 Visa gift card and they were like, have fun girl. And I was like, don't mind if I do. Um, so suffice to say the decisions that we were like tricked into making at the age of 18, we don't have to punish ourselves for. Well, that's the incredibly important part too, is this whole idea, which ties back to like bootstraps rhetoric around personal finance, that like you made this decision, it's your responsibility. Like, okay, sure, somebody's name was signed on the dotted line. Did somebody thoroughly explain how interest works and how much interest will accrue on those loans if they are not subsidized by the time that they graduate school? Was it explained the difference between federal and private student loans? Was it explained in a way that's actually easy to understand and not in like a 25 minute seminar in a room full of hundreds and hundreds of other kids? No, probably not. So Woo! like, that feels a little like fraud. A hundred percent. I feel like any financial decision that you make in the era of your life where you drink jungle juice out of a Tupperware, like... <laughs> truer words. Truer words. <laughs> that is not a time you need to be paying... For Loco, anyone? <laughs> the original recipe? The one... <laughs> The one that nearly killed us. Hell yes. Hell yes. Also, did you guys see on, t on TikTok um, the woman who found out that the lemonade at Panera has 250 milligrams of caffeine for a small? And every comment was like, the new Four loco is born. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> Why does lemonade have caffeine? No, she was like tweaking. She'd had four of them. And she was like, I didn't realize there was 250 milligrams of caffeine per... Anyway, uh, I just got TikTok, guys. I've been on a journey. Um... <laughs> Okay, so perhaps the biggest flop of 2022 was working. Um, I think, so listen, we're all about the four-day work week at TFD um, because, yeah, it, it rocks. Um, because work sucks and doing less of it is better. And also half the time, if you work in an office job that you're working, you're in meetings that go nowhere, you're reading stuff on the internet, you're, you know, just like killing time basically. And there's tons of studies. I don't need to cite the science, but it's there. Um, but so we've heard a lot about quiet quitting. We've heard a lot about like people are just phoning in and at work. Um, so for me, work has been a huge flop. What about for you? So I've worked from home for six years. My dog is most of the comfort during the day. So when my husband does come home from his job where he has to leave the house and go somewhere, he's a teacher, by the way, so even in the pandemic was having to leave a house and go somewhere. I uh, really just am like, oh my God, human conversation, let's talk. This is also why I go to get lattes so that I can talk to another human. I see a lot of value in going into an office. However, I heard the Ooh, groans. Tough Give me a second. <laughs> I think commutes are a big part of why people don't like going into work. And you can't always afford to live walkable from your job, especially in this city. So it really makes a lot of sense why people don't want to, especially five days a week, be going into an office. I think a lot of the response to quiet quitting was the, hey guys, you need to come back five days a week. I know you moved an hour and a half away from the city in the pandemic too bad. And that's been a big part of the movement, plus just like general frustration with wage stagnation, lack of quality benefits, all sorts of other reasons that we're like tethering ourselves for, to an employer for everything in our lives, but they don't really care about us at all. Um, I don't know. Did you guys see that article on tragically the New York Post that was like, um, Gen Z is killing after work drinks. Um, so... I, someone Another like, reason to go into an office. <laughs> well, so between that and like the five day a week in office, we do two days a week, which I, I do think hybrid work is that girl personally, because I, I don't like to just be sitting in my pajamas 
every day staring at my walls. But, you know, whatever. I live in New York. It's not a lot to see. But someone on Twitter responding to the, like, the after work drinks and the coming back to the office, they're like, won't someone think of, like, the well-paid men who don't want to go home to their family's community? Because that is truly who is driving all of these things. It's like, we need to be at work all the time. We need to be socializing with our coworkers all the time. We need to never, ever, ever go home. I mean, let's think about who called back employees the earliest. I mean, it's mostly the people who are in either FIDI or right near Murray Hill. Like, those are kind of the two areas that we're like, let's go all the way back to work, guys. They all have their matching button downs and their vests going back to work. There was a contingent of men on the train from Greenwich in their gingham button downs and their Patagonia vests. They were like, I have to be at home with my family all the time. Like... Oof, can't, can't be me. Um, so but this is a personality conversation too, right? Like I think that this is a very interesting part of this whole dynamic is that for some people there is value in the in-person connection and wanting to go to work and having the experience of getting out of the house. And for other people it's like nightmare. True. So some of that is also being open to employee wants and needs and having to be an employer that adapts. And I don't think there's anything wrong with requiring a certain amount of days a week, but also being open to, I don't know, employees changing lives as well. Like what happens if somebody's in a season of a life where they maybe need a little bit more flexibility? And so asking them to be in the office five days a week from nine to six and in meetings all day without a lot of flexibility is going to make them quiet quit. Exactly, AKA doing their jobs. Um, <laughs> thank you, Saida. Uh, so just to finish this up before we throw it to the Q and A, um, I would love to hear what is your money mantra for 2023? We talked about this a little bit in the green room before coming out, which had like great red light mood lighting, by the way, before we came out, it was so wonderful. And I actually am stealing this idea from, I can't even tell you which podcast I was listening to, but. There was a lot of conversation around how the market is doing, recession fears, and this concept that like in a recession and in a down market, stagnant is a win. So this idea of you don't need to see a ton of growth, but not seeing a ton of loss is a very good win for you personally. So for me, I'm kind of going into 2023 being like, hoping for a nice increase. But you know what? Maybe stagnant, just evening out is going to be a win. Not every year has to be a banger. Although we're coming off of like three tragic years, so at some point, let's make one a banger, guys. (laughs) Let's get a banger going in the chat. Okay, um, my money mantra, and honestly life mantra for 2023 is, if it's not serving me, I don't serve it. So very much like anything that I'm doing in my life, I wanna do a cost benefit analysis. That means my time, that means my energy, that means like I once, okay, this is a horrible anecdote. No, no one is in the room who would have been aware of, except Lauren, Lauren is gonna know who I'm talking about. But we once did an interview with this woman who was like, I decided that I wasn't getting dividends from all of my friends. So I wrote all of my friends down on a piece of paper and I drew a line and anyone under that line I got rid of. That's a bit much. I do think that's a bit much. But I do think it's... I think that says a lot about how that person was investing into their relationships, though. She had a lot going on. I'll just... I hope she's okay. But anyway... (laughs) Suffice to say, I think that's a bit extreme, but I do think it's good to just do a nice inventory in your life, in the people, in the projects, in the ways you're spending your time, and just remember that at the end of the day, less is better as long as you're focusing on the quality of the things you have and the things you're doing. And one thing we absolutely learned with the 32-hour work week is like our productivity went up, our profitability went up, like everything went up because you actually do much better work when you're giving yourself enough time to breathe. So be very choosy about what you give yourself time and energy too. And that can include people with whom you need to set boundaries. Yes. Yes. Um, well, thank you guys. Um, woo! Um, and thank you, Erin. Um, so we are going to throw it to the Q&A. So we have a little bit of time. Uh, Lauren? Yes. Anyone know Lauren Verhaeg? Yeah. Woo! <laughs> we sure do. Um, okay, she's going to be coming around with a microphone. So if you have a question, just throw your hands up. Yeah, just throw your hands up and I'll walk around and we'll this pass This hand went mic. up really fast. Oh, okay. so my friend. you out right now. <laughs> All right, on my way. Hello. Hi. <laughs> what are your thoughts on overemployment? Overemployment. Yes. 
Define the term. Yeah, do we want to elaborate? Overemployment is when you're working two remote jobs at the exact oh. same time. <laughs> oh, God, literally. Okay. Um, get it? I mean, I... <laughs> Not the journey I would choose. I do think, though, I have a bit of an ethical quandary with that. I understand the idea of, like, stick it to the man in these big corporations, but it also depends on, like, who are these employers. If you're doing that to a small business, that's not very fair. So do think that through. And also, like, which 401k are we picking? Which benefits are we taking? I have a lot of follow-up questions for the people who do that. I do like the idea of diversifying income, though, to throw back to earlier in this chat. So maybe instead of two full-time jobs, we one full-time job with nice benefits, pick the one with the better benefits, do the math on what those benefits are, and then like maybe we side hustle something else so we can also just opt out when we want to opt out. Um, I So we actually have a staffer at TFD who's relative is currently scamming to like white collar jobs by doing them both at the same time un unbeknownst to the other and we actually recorded a video today where we talked about how that's a huge phenomenon in remote work where like especially yeah. like tech people and stuff like that they're like I do like 10 hours a week of work I don't need to be doing more I personally believe in deliverable based work so like if you're doing the job like if someone were working at TFD and had another it's a little bit easier with a 32 hour work week but if someone was maintaining another full time job on top of it all I care about is the results so I'm like honestly work if you can manage to keep two jobs at once. Um, but that being said, I would only do it if there was like a real purpose to that extra money because otherwise I do think like it can be extremely addictive to just keep working for working's sake. So yeah. The over accumulation of money, but that's a conversation for another time. Hi. Hi. So I actually have a follow-up kind of related question because I don't want to work that hard. Girl, same. I'm here for it. Thank you. Um, so I'm like at the very, I'm like the elder millennial slash baby Gen X, um, whatever that means. But so there's so much about side hustle, side hustles. You got your full time, you got your side hustles, multiple streams of income, and I'm just, I'm here for it. But at the same time, I'm just like, you know what? My one time job, it's long, it's hard. It takes a lot of time and energy and emotional effort and labor. I don't want to have to have a second stream of income that I have to think about, do, and maintain because I'm paranoid and worried about the first one, the main one that I do. And it's not really so much a question on like what to do or think about it, but I'm just, I, I want to kind of bring that up as just a a thought exercise of what happens if we just do the, you know, we just do the job that we got, that we spent all the time, that I got a doctorate for. Woo! Well, and I'm like, that's really all I give a shit about. That's As you fine. should. <laughs> Listen, I think a lot of this comes down to mindset and mentality, right? Like, if you are perfectly happy and content where you are that's amazing because also contentment is incredibly hard for people to find true so honestly you've like unlocked a next level achievement compared to a lot of people who are engaging in side hustle culture and hustle culture in general it's like oh, i gotta get up at four o'clock in the morning and drink my bullet coffee and then like do 25 <laughs> setups and meditate for an hour and a half and read seven self-help books and then i'll start my day <laughs> i really get frustrated with the hustle culture where I'm going to counter a little bit is the conversation around now granted I'll admit this is scarcity mentality but people for whom they are staying up at night concerned about that primary job where I'm talking about the diversification of how you can earn money can help appease that mindset now the way you're diversifying doesn't have to be another full-time job with a full employer. It also doesn't have to be something that brings you stress. Like if you can try to find something that maybe builds on skills that you already have, something that you actually enjoy. Side note, please don't monetize your hobby. Let that be for funsies. As soon as you monetize it, it's not fun anymore. <laughs> or you're just doing something that would cost so much money. Like you would have to sell it for so much money. Like I crochet now, guys. Um, the scarves that I crochet would have to be sold for like $200 to make it worth the hours that it takes to create those things and the supplies. But I think most of us have various ways that we could potentially earn other money that feels legal and ethical and moral to us. 
And if maybe a good brain exercise is to ideate on what could I do if the worst happens and if it's really hard to find a job in my current industry, where and how could I pivot? And also write out your social safety net. So beyond just your baseline emergency fund, what are the resources that you have within your community, within your family, within your friend group? Who could you move in with if you needed to? Who could provide childcare if you needed that? Who could help network you to get you a job? Writing that kind of stuff down early as a preventative measure gives a lot of peace of mind as well. Very well said. I would also say, like, if you have a job that you like, that pays you enough, that you're happy at, that isn't taking over your life, you won at capitalism. Congratulations. Like, <laughs> continue to vibe. You don't always need to be growing. Sometimes you can just be vibing. Um, but I will say, and one thing that's worth saying, if you've been at a certain employer for more than a few years, unless they're aggressive about making sure your compensation is keeping up with your worth, you're probably underpaid statistically. That's just true. And most people realize their biggest raises when they change employers, and that's just true. So one thing to always be doing is keeping your options open. Look at what else is out there. Look on Glassdoor. Like, see if you could be making a lot more money at your primary job. And if you love your job, like have the conversation with your employer. Like, Get another offer in hand, which is easier than you think. If you're halfway decent at your job. And also remember, it is way harder for your employer to replace you than just to keep you happy. Um, go to them and be like, listen, I love this job. I want to stay here. I love my team, but I am being like X amount underpaid. And here's the proof. Can we match? Can we get close? Um, a, a shocking number of people don't do that, especially, especially women. So even at your primary job, you can be leveling up, but again, still vibing. You don't have to work more hours. Just like get more money for what you're doing. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hang on. <laughs> uh, first of all, what the? I'm here and you guys are here. So shocked. Ah, <laughs> love that for us. Yeah. Okay. So I don't really know how to word the question. I just know what I want to know, but I don't know Let's the question. Hear it. Um, okay. So I would like to go full time with my content creation, but I think what's holding me back is fear. So I guess the question really is at what point did uh, you, Chelsea, and, and Lauren decide, well, okay, we're ready to take this on and like create. TFD, uh, did you save up first or did you guys just take the risk and was like, let's do it? <laughs> uh, Lauren, you want to say anything on that? Because the answer is no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, I think that in terms of like feeling ready to leave a job or to start something full time, it is, there is a lot of pressure there. And I feel like, you know, when we did it, we were young and we kind of, we had our emergency fund and you know, things were different. And if I did it now, I think it would be harder. Like the older you get, the more fear you have. But I, I, I don't know. I think that <sighs> surround yourself with people who I think you can learn from and like you can feel like are bringing you forward and, and like having that, I don't know, that like network around you is helpful. But also, I mean, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's tough. Sorry. Oh, I, it's, there's no good answer to this. And yeah. I will say like, I was forged in the fires of the internet. Like no one asked me, do you want to create content publicly? They were yeah. like, write four articles a day about your feelings and hope they go viral so you can keep your job. And I was like, okay. Um, so I was creating content publicly well before I should have been well before I knew what I was doing. Um, and I wrote some really terrible stuff when I was young. I like got kind of a little bit canceled. Like I got into trouble. Like I was, I definitely look back at a lot of my early Google results pre TFD and even early TFD and I cringe and I'm like, you know, this sucks. But the really good thing about the internet, you know, unless you do something like massively bad is that like the internet forgets so fast. Like if you're worried that I'm not going to make the kind of stuff that I want to make, you probably won't. Like the first stuff that you make and publish and put your name behind and, you know, leave your job for is probably not going to be the best stuff you do. Um, but the internet's going to forget about it and so will you. And so the longer you wait to try, like Lauren said, the harder and harder it gets because the one thing you have on your side is like that, you know, energy of youth and saying like, hey, even if I mess up, it's going to be okay. So create that very like B-list content that you're going to look back on in a year and be like, that was a mess and move on from it. Follow-up question. Is it that you're already creating content and you want to quit your current job and make the leap? Do you have a number in your head of how much money you need to be making in order to survive? Um, like, I have numbers, but then I always want to know, oh my God, I want to make exactly what I'm doing. 
Okay, aspirational, yes, but realistic, maybe eventually. I think that the first question is the, not only the risk-reward matrix, but the regret matrix. How much are we going to regret not taking this chance on ourselves? And do we have, so when I made the leap, I had a year's worth of living expenses saved and earmarked for, I'm going to take a chance because there's already something that I had done at that point in my life where I'm like, I wish I had done that and I didn't and I regret not doing it. So I'm not going to let that happen again. I'm going to take a chance. And if in a year this has bottomed out in a fiery flame, I'll just go back to the workforce. You can always go back. Oh, also, like, I I didn't even say this, but, like, if you are doing content creation independently, you've gained, like, 10 skills that you can reapply to the workforce and probably makes you more employable. And as I put earlier, like, you have to kind of change jobs to get better pay anyway, so you might as well, like, do it. Honestly, like, we did not have a plan like that, and I will tell you that the worst thing that happens is you go back to a job. Like, now's the time. Just figure out your benefits. Carpe diem, girl. Just know how to have health care. That's really... Oh, yeah, have health care. Let's not forget Your age could really impact that. If you're under 30, it's way cheaper. But as soon as you hit 30, it's like, you're off the catastrophic plan. I think we have time for one more question. Oh, going to be a sweet. Pass that mic down. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Hi, my name is Christine. Good evening, everyone. My question is on, like, next-gen like trends that have been moving. So obviously you guys talked about work from home and that environment has drastically changed things for everybody, right? So how, in terms of like your content, right? How have you guys been modifying like your, like how have you guys been like noticing the trends and like modifying your investing advice or financial advice based on that? Like I'd love to understand like where where do you think we're going moving forward just to clarify based on the climate or based on gen z um because those are two different answers based on both if you don't mind running over like based on the work and home environment and all everything that's happened and then based on gen z like the next they call us like the big banks call us next gen right so well i'm making tiktoks now isn't that enough for you i mean debasing myself on that platform uh no i'm actually enjoying tiktok it's horrible i'm just like making recipes anyway um Uh, Point being, uh, in terms of content, like we have, you know, we contract with younger creators um, for certain types of content that just speak to a different place in, you know, life that I no longer am. You know, a lot of the staff is no longer at that place necessarily. So I think in terms of the generational thing, it's reaching people where they are. Luckily, you know, we're primarily on YouTube still. And younger people do seem to still watch videos, although that's tenuous. They have to be 30 seconds, <laughs> um, which is like a hard way to convey nuanced financial information, but whatever. Um, but so, you know, from a content perspective and from the younger perspective, it's just kind of making the information very accessible. As far as adapting to the climate, I mean, from my perspective, we have 100 years plus of market data. Like these things, nothing is new. Like nothing, things feel new and scary. But nothing is really new. Nothing is really that scary. Like these market up and downturns happen. And I think the worst thing you can do is radically adapt your message based on what are ultimately temporary fluctuations. So to take current climate first, I mean, I definitely will just bring out of the vault because, again, we've already been through this stuff before. I'm just like, hey, guys, remember when I talked about this several years ago and we thought it was just a market correction and now it looks like the stock market is free falling? Don't worry. It'll come back. And talking, I like throwing back to data. I think talking about the history of things can be a very powerful way to talk about, like, this has happened before. We have survived. We will come around again. Also, that every generation thinks that they have it the worst. And I mean, millennials did, but like talking, I'm just kidding. (laughs) I think it's also helpful to put into perspective, like, hey, you might have forgotten, but this is what XYZ generations went through. And look, they came out on the other side. So I like to contextualize in that way because also I'm a history nerd, but that's a whole different thing. In terms of courting Gen Z, my brand is called Broke Millennial. Like it could not be less interesting in many ways to Gen Z And also, I think that they should have their own cohort of folks that are going through similar lived experiences, were reared in similar ways, in the sense that, like, 
happy to have them, but not going out of my way to court them and not in an isolationist way, but like I'm truly not on TikTok because I just can't add one more thing. Like that's me saying I'm choosing not to take this on and setting boundaries for myself. So like your 2023 20, mantra is like me with TikTok. And I really love the fact that you are seeing like a whole influx of voices into the personal finance space that are speaking to dynamics. I am 33 years old. I felt young until like literally this year. <laughs> and I still like feel good, but then I watch, I don't know, like a pilot episode of a sitcom I watched in high school and the lead character is 31 and I'm like triggered. <laughs> this is rude. So I think it's important to not always be trying to be like, oh my God, I'm still young and fun. I understand all of this stuff. I'm like, nope, uh, this is what I've been through. This is where I am. If it's not for you, that's okay. Here's like 20 people over here who probably have a more relatable lived experience, but I'm happy to talk to you if you want to talk to me. I think that's very true. And like to that point, as far as accessibility, like I have to share this TikTok anecdote. I'm sorry. I've been on it for four days. It's top of mind. Um, but I like posted this video. A bunch of people were like, where'd you get this lamp? And so I made a video about the lamp where I was like, this is where I got the lamp. And then and that video like strangely went way off and all these people were like that lamp is so expensive how like I would never buy that how ew like and I was like what you guys asked me where I got it and so so many people were messaging me and being like girl TikTok is a bunch of Gen Z they they're not about the life that you're living right now like they're they're not gonna get it you have to wait for the algorithm to like sort you both out because right now you're getting the scrum and so I do think not that all of Gen Z is the scrum but if you're coming on someone's TikTok to yell at them about what they paid um, and so I do think that there's there's something to be said for like everyone like you experiencing as Gen Z the current market moment that we're going through is very different for Aaron or I like we're just at different vantage points and I do think it's important to remember that there's limits in that and that we can't speak to the same thing but there's something good about that in the sense that this is not new and we'll all generally be okay. Yeah, like I'm fine with being the like big sister from your dad's first marriage that's 10 years older than you who's oh talking to you about financial advice. You're like, I mean, sometimes she makes sense, but also <laughs> we're in very different phases of life. And I just feel like it's incredibly important to always acknowledge that, that my Broke Millennials started in January of 2013, so it turns a decade next month. Woo! Thank you. Ow, ow. But 23-year-old Aaron and 33-year-old Aaron are in very different places. 23-year-old Aaron was still like taking home Starbucks leftovers after a shift to put in the freezer so she could afford to eat. 33-year-old Aaron is married and takes nice vacations with her husband. So it's just like very different phases. And I think that there's a lot of rich content to be like, I remember when, but also like that's not always relatable either because does anyone like it when their parents do that to them? No. Well, thank you, Erin, and thank you guys so much for this episode.